Hello everyone, I am Saloni Arora and today we will discuss chapter 9 of class 12 psychology textbook which is Developing Psychological Skills. This chapter has been divided into two parts. We will discuss the first part which includes the skills related to becoming an effective psychologist. It covers general skills, observational skills and communication skills as a part of specific skills. Let's first start with the concept of developing as an effective psychologist. Most people think that they are some kind of psychologist. We at times talk about intelligence, inferiority complex, identity crisis, mental blocks, attitude, stress, communication barriers and so many other terms. Generally, people pick up such terms from popular writings and media. This kind of everyday amateur psychology often misfires, sometimes even proves disastrous. There still remains a question of how to differentiate between a pseudo-psychologist from a real psychologist. An answer can be constructed by asking such questions like professional training, educational background, institutional affiliation and his or her experience in providing service. They cover a range of knowledge that a psychologist should possess when entering the profession after completing their education and training. These apply to practitioners, academicians and researchers whose roles involve consulting with students, business, industry and broader community. It is recognized that it is difficult to develop, implement and measure competencies required in a subject like psychology as the criteria for specification, identification and evaluation are not yet fully agreed upon. The basic skills or competencies which psychologists have identified for becoming an effective psychologist fall into three broad sections, namely general skills, observational skills and specific skills. So the first set of skills are general skills. These skills are generic in nature and are needed by all psychologists irrespective of their field of specialization. These skills are essential for all professional psychologists whether they are working in the field of clinical or health psychology, industrial or organizational, social, educational or in environmental settings or are acting as consultants. These skills include personal as well as intellectual skills. It is expected that it will not be a proper way to provide any form of professional training in clinical or organizational fields to students who do not possess these skills. Once a student has these skills, subsequent training in his or her area of specialization would only refine and further sharpen these skills required by a professional within his or her field of specialization. General skills include intellectual and personal skills and one of them is interpersonal skills which includes ability to listen and be empathic, to develop respect or interest in others' culture. The second skill within your intellectual and personal skill is cognitive skill, which includes ability to solve problems, engage in critical thinking and organize reasoning. The third skill is affective skill, including emotional control and balance, tolerance and understanding of interpersonal conflict. The fourth one is personality, which includes desire to help others, openness to new ideas, honesty, integrity and personal courage. The fifth one is expressive skills, which include ability to communicate one's ideas, feelings and information in verbal, non-verbal and written form. Sixth one is reflective skills, including ability to examine and consider one's own motives, attitudes, behaviors and ability to be sensitive to one's own behaviors or others. The seventh one is personal skills, including 
personal organization, personal hygiene, time management, and appropriate dress. Another set of skills under general skills include sensitivity to diversity, including individual and cultural differences, knowledge about the nature and impact of individual and cultural diversity in different situations. The next skill including under this topic is ability to work effectively with diverse backgrounds in assessment, treatment and consultation, ability to respect and appreciate different cultural norms and belief and the last one is being sensitive to one's preferences and also to one's preference for own group. So we have covered the topic of general skills. The next skills are observational skills. A great deal of what psychologists as researchers and practitioners do in the field is to pay attention, watch and listen carefully. They use all the senses noticing what is seen, heard, smell, tasted or touched. A psychologist thus is like an instrument that absorbs all sources of information from the environment. A psychologist engages in observing various facets of surroundings including people and varying events. To begin with, a psychologist may begin with carefully scrutinizing the physical setting in order to capture its atmosphere. He or she might look at the color of the floor or ceiling, size of the window or doors, type of lightning, artifacts, paintings, etc. These small, subtle and irrelevant looking signals influence human behavior, which is why a psychologist notes such signals in the surroundings. In addition, to physical surroundings. A psychologist actively engages in observing people and their actions. This may include the demographic features, age, gender, race, etc., ways of dealing and relating with others, pattern of behaviors in the presence of others, and etc. A psychologist records such details because something of significance may be revealed in the process of observation. The following points are taken into consideration while making an observation. Observe patiently. Pay close attention to your physical surroundings. Who, what, when, where and how. Be aware of people's reactions, emotions and motivations. Ask questions that can be answered while observing. Be yourself. Give information about yourself if asked. Observe with an optimistic curiosity. And be ethical. You have to respect privacy, norms of people you are observing. And lastly, take care not to disclose any information to anyone. Now let's get familiar with two major approaches to observation. Naturalistic observation and participant observation. Let us now consider developing skills about them. The first observation is naturalistic observation, which is one of the primary ways of learning about the way people behave in a given setting. Suppose you want to learn how people behave in response to a heavy discount provided by a company while visiting a shopping mall. For this, you could visit the shopping mall where the discounted items are showcased and systematically observe what people do and say and after the purchases have been made. Making comparison of this kind may provide you with useful insights into what is going on. The second type of observation is participant observation which is a variation of the method of naturalistic observation. Here, the observer is actively involved in the process of observing by becoming an active member of the setting where the observation takes place. For the problem mentioned above, an observer may take a part-time job in a shopping mall showroom to become an insider in order to observe variations in the behavior of customers. This technique is widely used by anthropologists 
whose objective is to gain a first hand perspective of a system from within which otherwise which may not be readily available to an outsider. What are the advantages and disadvantages of observation? One disadvantage of it is that events being observed are subject to bias due to the feelings of the people involved as well as of the observers. Generally, day-to-day -day activities in a given setting are fairly routine which can go unnoticed by the observer. And another potential pitfall is that the actual behavior and responses of others may get influenced by the presence of the observer, thus defeating the very purpose of observation. So we have covered general skills, observational skills, and lastly now we will discuss specific skills. Now specific skills are core or basic to the field of psychological service. For example, psychologists working in clinical settings need to be trained in various techniques of therapeutic interventions, psychological assessment and counselling. Though specific skills and competencies are required for very specialised professional functioning, nonetheless all skill sets do overlap quite a bit. They are not exclusive to an area. Relevant specific skills and competencies can be classified as follows. The first is communication skills, second is psychological testing skills, third interviewing skills and lastly the counselling skills. We will cover the first concept which is communication skills. Let us understand the basics of communication process and see what role it plays in fostering relationships and personal effectiveness. Learning how to be an effective communicator is not just as an academic exercise. It is one of the most important skills you will need to succeed in life. Your success in this class may well depend on your ability to communicate. So what do we mean by communication process? It can be said that communication is a conscious or unconscious, intentional or unintentional process in which feelings and ideas are expressed as verbal or non-verbal messages that are sent, received and comprehended. The process of communication can be accidental, that is having no intent, expressive, resulting from the emotional state of the person or rhetorical, resulting from the specific goal of the communicator. Human communication occurs on the intrapersonal, interpersonal and public levels. Intrapersonal communication involves communicating with yourself. It encompasses such activities as thought processes, personal decision making and focusing on self. The next type of communication is interpersonal communication, which refers to the communication that takes place between two or more persons who establish a communicative relationship. Forms of interpersonal communication include face-to-face -face or mediated conversations interview and small group discussions. Lastly, public communication is characterized by a speaker sending a message to an audience. It may be direct, such as face-to-face -face messages delivered by the speaker to an audience or indirect, such as message relayed over radio or television. What are the components of human communication? When we communicate, we communicate selectively, that is, from the wide range of repertory of words, actions, etc. available to us, we choose that which we believe is best suited for the idea we wish to express. When we communicate, we encode that is, take ideas, give them meaning and put them into message forms and send the idea through a channel. It is composed of a primary signal system based on our senses, that is, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling and touching. The message is sent to someone who receives it using his or her primary signal system. He or she then decodes, that is, 
translate messages into understandable forms. Now for example, you may say that you heard a bell or an object feels soft. These are examples of verbal communication which express how you understand the signals your senses have received. You can also respond at a non-verbal level. You touch a hot stove, your fingers pull away quickly and your eyes well up with tears. The pulling away of fingers and welling up of eyes with tears will communicate to an onlooker the pain suffered by you. The first component of communication is speaking. One important component of communication is speaking with the use of language. Language involves use of symbols which enclose meaning within them. To be effective, a communicator must know how to use language appropriately because language is symbolic. It is necessary to be as clear and precise as possible when using words. Communication also takes place within a context. So one needs to consider the other stream of reference, that is, the context used by the sender to say something. Also, whether he or she shares your interpretation. If not, it is important to adjust your vocabulary level and choice of words to fit the level of the listener. Remember that slang expressions and words unique to a culture or religion can sometimes become obstacles in good communication. The second component of communication is listening. Listening is an important skill that we use daily. Your academic success, employment achievement and personal happiness to a large extent depend upon your ability to listen effectively. Listening requires a person to be attentive. He or she should be patient, non-judgmental and yet have the capacity to analyze and respond. Hearing and listening are not the same. Hearing is a biological activity that involves reception of a message through your sensory channels. It is only a part of listening, a process that involves reception, attention, assignment of meaning and listener's response to the message presented. The third component is reception. The initial step in the listening process is the reception of a stimulus or message. A message could be auditory or visual. The hearing process is based on a complex set of physical interactions that take place involving the ear and the brain. In addition to using the hearing mechanism, people listen through their visual system. They observe a person's facial expressions, posture, movement, appearance, which provide important cues that may not be obvious merely by listening to the verbal part of the message. The next component is attention. Once the stimulus that is the word or visual or both is received, it reaches the attention stage of the human processing system. In this phase, the other stimuli recede so that we can concentrate on specific words or visual symbols. Normally, your attention is divided between what you are attempting to listen to and what is happening around you and what is going on in your mind. Now consider you are watching a movie. The person in front of you is constantly whispering to his or her friend. There is a buzz in the sound system. You are also worried about the forthcoming examination. So your attention is being pulled in different directions. Divided attention makes it difficult for you to receive signals or messages. The fifth component is paraphrasing. How would you know that someone has been listening? You will ask him or her to restate what you had said. The person in doing this does not repeat your exact words. He or she makes a summary of the ideas just received and provides you with a restatement of what he or she understands. This is called paraphrasing. It allows you to understand how much he or she understood or what was communicated. If someone cannot repeat or write down a summary of what was said, then he or she probably did not get the whole message or did not understand it.
we can keep this in mind when we are listening to our teacher in the class or to others. Try to paraphrase what you have heard and if you cannot do so, you should seek immediate clarification if possible. The next component is assignment of meaning. The process of putting the stimulus we have received into some predetermined category develops as we acquire language. We develop mental categories for interpreting the message we receive. For instance, our categorizing system for the word cheese may include such factors as a dairy product, its peculiar taste and color, all of which helps us to relate the word cheese to the sense in which it is used. The next component is role of culture in listening. Like the brain, the culture in which we have been brought up also influences our listening and learning abilities. Asian cultures such as India emphasize on listening by being a silent communicator when receiving messages from seniors or elders. Some cultures also focus on controlling attention. Buddhism, for instance, has a notion called mindfulness. This means devoting your complete attention to whatever you are doing. And the last component is body language. We are aware that non-verbal acts are symbolic and closely connected to any talk in progress. Such non-verbal acts are part of what is called body language. Body language is composed of all those messages that people exchange beside words. While reading body language, we must remember that a single non-verbal signal does not carry complete meaning. Factors such as gestures, postures, eye contact, clothing style and body movement, all of them have to be considered together, that is in a cluster. Also in verbal communication, Non-verbal signs can have many different meanings. For example, crossing arms over the chest may suggest that a person likes to keep aloof. But crossed arms accompanied by an erect posture, tightened body muscles, a set clenched jaw and narrowing of the eyes are likely to communicate anger. A person's background and past patterns of behavior are also considered when we analyze body language. The consistency between current and past patterns of behavior as well as the harmony between verbal and non-verbal communication is termed as congruency. When you say to your friend, you do not look well today, you are basing your statement on an evaluation of the person's appearance today and comparing it with how he or she looked in the past. In other words, something has changed and you see that difference. If you did not have experience to draw on, you would not have noticed that change. Let us recall how much we use body language to encourage or discourage conversation. For instance, we consciously wave at waiters or friends to catch their attention. Much of the use of body language occurs in conversing with others without conscious realization. So in this way, we have completed general skills, observational skills, and communication skills as a part of specific skills. I hope you all have understood the concepts really well. Thank you.